So we did a little something different here. A lot of you have been to, um, into some of the uh, breakouts with Mark Smith. We wanted to bring him up on the stage today rather than bring out some, well, celebrity or something like that. But Mark in his own mind is a celebrity, so it's cool. So just what's the, we'll pretend like he's a sports star when he comes out, but Mark's done work for Varnix for over f uh, five years. I'm gonna read this a little bit because he gave me some notes here. He's been a part of the Varnix community since 2010. I've known Mark for even longer than that. I will take claim I helped introduce him to his wife that used to work with me. So I am like a little Cupid up here with him. Uh, he's always bringing us business and technology insights to help grow our business. Today he shares ideas from his newest book, From MSP to BSP, Pivot from Managed Service Provider to Business Service Provider to Profit from IT dis Disruption. So please welcome Mark Smith. A little Cupid. That's right, Bob. Molly is grateful that we met because we've had a great life together. My friends, it's such, been such a pleasure to be part of this community for since 2010. And right now, we are seeing more disruption in our industry than ever before. Would you agree with that? It is just massively disruptive of the things that are going on. I'd like to share with you some of the things I see going on some of the warning signs that I see that we have to pay attention to and some ways that we can make more money than ever before. How's that sound? I'll just mainly make sure I'm in the right room doing the right thing and thank you. Both of you. <laughs> I love this. The world is changing faster than you can imagine. You spend five to 10% of your time just keeping up with the technology. Yet, how much time do your customers spend keeping up with technology? The challenge that we face is that technology changes at an exponential rate, thanks to Moore's Law. Yet your customers grow at a logarithmic rate, 10% per year compounded annually until they reach that asymptote, that level, that represents the cognitive capacity of their top officer. And what we're noticing here is that we're reaching this place to where there's massive disruption in lots of industries because of Martech's law. A lot of household names have disappeared. Of the original Dow Jones Industrial Average list, there's only one left, and that's GE. That's it. The rest of them are gone. And that's going to continue to change like this over time. So as the capacity of your customers' executives start to peak out, what we assume is Careful wisdom is actually just fatigue. And if you're in the business of selling technology, that should scare you just a little bit. Mark Benahoff points out that today, companies are no longer competing against each other. They're competing against speed. How quickly can they adapt and adopt to this leading technology? And remember when you used to have to go to work? Remember that? And the reason why is because that's where your computer terminated to the data center network, and that's where your phone line connected to your desk set. That's no longer the case. We no longer go to work. We just work. And the end result is we don't care where the data center exists or even that it exists. And if you sell to data centers then you should be a little bit scared. And we're seeing technologies come online like never before, AI and everything. Who here goes to Comdex? We used to call it Comdex, right? Now it's called CES, right? We no longer have a data center massive show. We have a consumer massive show. So who goes to CES? All right, for all of you that are selling technology, if you want to see what you're going to be selling in the next three years, you come to CES. That's where we're seeing it. 
And every automobile manufacturer has a roadmap to a level five car. They're showing them at CES. In fact, you can take rides in them from the airport to your hotel if you're willing to sign a waiver. Now, as far as I'm concerned, if I have to sign a waiver, I'm in. If I have to wear a bib, I'm in. And I have to sign a waiver and a bib, bucket list, right? But the thing is, is that AI is going to take over the design of the data center and the orchestration of the systems because it can do it way better than we can. And if you sell the data center, that should scare you just a little bit. And then we're hearing more and more about virtual reality and augmented reality, how it changes the world. And every one of your vendors is working on an augmented reality application that will do a better job at break fix than your $150 technicians. And if you want a piece of AR, look at these growth numbers that are being predicted by IDC from 5.2 billion last year to 162 billion in three years. Who wants a piece of that action? There's a lot of money to be made there, my friends. But if you're in the world of break fix, you should be a little scared. And take a look at this list. What do these have in common? Spotify, Nest, Kickstarter, Square, Instagram, Snapchat, WhatsApp, iPhone, iPad, Kindle, Uber, Airbnb, Android, Oculus. What do they have in common? Tell me. Just shout it out. You're a long way away. They didn't exist a decade ago. What else? They don't manufacture anything. They're all based on data, and they're all based on context. So if you're in the business of selling things, you should be afraid. You should be a bit scared. This is the world we live in, my friends. IT is no longer driven by business, but by consumers. We don't decide what goes in the data center anymore. The consumers do. This is causing massive business disruption. What that means is that if you are planning to sell IT to data centers in the future, you should be scared. See, here's what's happening. Every industry is getting disrupted. Retail is dying rapidly. Way more stores are closing than are opening. Why is that? If you're saying Amazon, the real reason is because shopping sucks. <laughs> That's why we use Amazon. Who here buys from Amazon? Every hand. Right. That's exactly right. Remember these guys? 9,000 stores five years ago, and three stores left open. Yeah, yeah, in, in Alaska. <laughs> well, they don't have the bandwidth for uh, Netflix. No kidding. Now, these guys are amazing. Their 2017 production budget is $6 billion. They were only worth four on Wall Street three years ago. See, Netflix knows exactly how you watch TV. They know what you like to watch, and they know what gives you goosebumps because you keep watching that segment over and over and over again. So they write movies and shows to have more of those kinds of scenes. And that's the result. But Here's the real impact on the industry. Netflix has more subscribers than all of the cable providers in the United States combined. And if you're selling to cable providers, you should be a little bit scared. But wait, we're not done yet. Amazon has a 2017 production of 4.5 billion. And Amazon has all the context information about you, just like Netflix has, plus one that's really important. They know what you buy. So they're putting together shows to sell you things. Wow. If you sell to retail, if you sell to entertainment, you should be a little bit scared. And then there's these guys, right? When was the last time you had to voluntarily take a taxi? When was it? Voluntarily, right? That's the key word here. Yeah, not me. Multi-billion dollar company, they don't own a thing except your data. 
If you sell to the world of transportation, you should be a little bit scared. Perhaps you might know these folks. They sell training online. They were sold to LinkedIn for $1.5 billion. The worldwide online training business is worth $50 billion right now. And you, you can get any class online that Harvard teaches free. You can get any class that Yale teaches online free. Any class MIT teaches online free. Now, if you want the certificate, that's going to cost you a quarter million. And you got to take a few tests along the way. But if you're selling to education, you should be a little bit scared. We are seeing massive digital disruption in every industry. Nothing is being touched. Nothing is being untouched. So what do all of these have in common that I just shared with you? What do you think it is? What do they all have in common? Well, they're scary. <laughs> yeah, but you're consuming them all the time. <laughs> What they have in common is they create a frictionless customer experience. Watching movies is frictionless. Listening to music is frictionless. Buying something is frictionless. Getting transportation is frictionless. Learning is frictionless. And my question to you is how much friction are you throwing into the mix for your customers? If you can't make it dead simple to get IT services, you're going to be Ubered. And quite frankly, the friction that has been created by the IT departments saying no is the reason why IT departments are failing. I'll explain a little bit more about that in just a moment. See, we're transitioning from an age of ownership to an age of frictionless access. As baby boomers, those of you who are baby boomers, we were raised with the concept of own the means of production. That's what we bought five years worth of IT up front, and we architected them and we engineered them together, even though we knew that that IT was being purchased at the maximum possible price. IT is the most rapidly declining asset in the entire organization. Because of Moore's Law, it's worth half of what it was in the next year. And yet we buy for five years in advance, over-provisioned for two, under-provisioned for three. That is no longer a viable business model when we have other alternatives. The days of architecting data centers for five years for organizations is over. And that should scare you just a little bit. See, we're moving from that baby boomer value of pay for ownership with the underlying fear of loss, and that's why we insure everything, to we're moving to a millennial view of the world of paying for access. We rent everything, we lease everything. And when that happens, you have no longer a fear of loss. There's nothing to lose, it's somebody else's, woohoo! <laughs> but what comes along with that is a fear of missing out. Because if you can change vendors, 30 day notice, you wanna see what else is out there. And if you think this is gonna cause chaos, you'd be right. This changes completely how we sell things. And the end result of this is that big companies are going to be going away. Information Age predicted in April of this year that 40% of the Fortune 500 won't exist in 10 years because they won't survive the digital disruption of cloud, of the Internet of Things, of who needs a data center, who cares about the data center. What do you think? You think this is true? I think it's going to be more than that. Because a lot of, of the Fortune 500 haven't figured out the frictionless thing yet. You think about your IT vendors right now. How hard do they make it for you to place an order? That should scare you just a little bit. If we don't make it frictionless, my friends, we ain't going to do it. <laughs> Recognize this guy? Used to run HP for a while. Now he's running Oracle. HP's laying off people. Oracle's doing great. I think the board of directors may have made a mistake. <laughs> I'm not here to talk politics. I'm here to talk reality. What Mark says 
is that 80% of corporate data centers will be gone by 2025. The change will be not linear but exponential, which means it'll sneak up on you and bite you. Who thinks he's right? And I see about a third of the hands up. I think he's wrong. I think it's going to fa happen way faster. Here's why. We are about to see a mass retirement of baby boomer executives from your companies that you serve right now. And the reason why is because for the past 10 years, although they wanted to retire, they couldn't. Now that Wall Street is at all-time highs, they can afford to retire. Who's seeing this already starting to happen with your customers? All right, it looks like about 10% of you. It's going to accelerate in 2018. And guess who's going to replace them? Millennials, why? Why not Gen X? Because millennials are digital natives. They understand this stuff because they grew up with this stuff. And to a millennial, this is the data center. Hyper-converged. <laughs> Don't make me plummet together. Just give me some apps that work. And friends, let me give you a piece of advice after raising five millennial children. Number one, stop bashing millennials. Millennials, feel free to applaud. Thank you. Both of you. Stop the millennial bashing. It's not doing you any good. The reason why millennials are the way they are is because we raised them that way. We raised them to be the way that we wanted to be raised as we were kids. I did it to my kids. You did it to your kids. If you want to bash anybody, bash yourself. They are our future. I love my millennial kids. I'm becoming more of a millennial than ever before. I rent everything I possibly can. I lease everything I possibly can. I Uber every time I possibly can. And they've got something really going here about not having to fear loss of your stuff. I like it. Thank you. <laughs> so we're going to see massive changes here, my friend. Massive, massive things are going to go on. The question is, how can you be a managed services provider if there's nothing left in the data center to manage? If you're an MSP, you should be a little bit scared. So how are you going to survive and thrive in this disruption? The answer is very simple. It's time to reinvent you. Eric Hoffer said, in times of change, learners inherit the earth while the learned find themselves beautifully equipped to deal with a world that no longer exists. And if you're feeling right now like there's a gun to your head, it's time to sell your practice. But if you're feeling like you're about to get on a roller coaster, let's ride. Good times are ahead. Here's what's happening. We have massive models of business models that are pivoting. Not only the things I just shared with you about the change in the world and the change of uh, the guard, but we also have some massively changing business models I want to change with you, I want to share with you. The first thing you have to understand is that the, um, the source of, a of funds of a business determine its business model. If your money comes from Wall Street, you have one business model. If it comes from taxes, it's another business model. If it comes from tuition, it's yet another business model. If it comes from your own pocket, it comes yet another business model. And the fund source create the business model. The business model creates the business rules and the structure of the organization. And those get implemented in IT. The reality of all of you are in the business of business model and business rules implementation. You just probably haven't thought about it that way. But once the IT is there, then we can set the required executive and team acumen. For example, if you buy a franchise, you're buying the business model, the business rules, and the IT, which means that you as the business owner don't have to have a lot of acumen as long as you follow the business rules. Now, if you have a model that's a little bit more complex, it might take a little bit more. But the executive acumen then leads to the, the customers and the revenue, which then feeds back to the fund source. And all of this is overridden or influenced by the culture. This is the model for your future business. 
You're going to help your customers in every one of these squares. You're going to help them identify business models. You're going to help them identify business rules. You're going to implement those business rules in IT. You're going to help them figure out how to develop the acumen of their teams through educational systems and how to better interact with your customers. You know, as a sales trainer for decades, frequently I'm asked, Mark, how do I beat my competition? It's the wrong question. The question you should be asking is, how can I help my customers beat their competition? And when you do, there is no competition. This is where we're going. Well, right now, there's a lot of shifting business models. Let's take a look at what is changing. First of all, I want to share with you the vendor business model transformation. So virtually every vendor you do business with is listed on Wall Street, which means they're being driven by Wall Street's demands. In the world of Wall Street, if you have a dollar of transactional revenue, you're giving an X valuation. And if that same dollar of revenue is a recurring subscription revenue, you get 6X. What do you think CEOs are going to be doing? Pivoting to subscriptions. Now, of course, if you're Jeff Bezos, you get 250x. The man's a monster of business models. So what's happening is we're all moving from selling transactions to selling subscriptions. This is the reason why Oracle is making money and IBM has lost 22 quarters in a row. They've missed their performance. Every one of your vendors is figuring out how to do a subscription model. We're moving from designing products to architecting platforms. If you think about it, this is a platform. Five minutes after you buy it, it's unlike any other one of these on the planet because it's been personalized to whatever it is that you want to accomplish, you want to do. That's the platform mentality. We're moving from pitching closed proprietary systems to joining community-based open systems. The old value prop of one throat to choke doesn't play anymore. What plays is, do you play well with others? If so, hey, let's have some fun. As much as Cisco and IBM and HP and Dell would like for you to have a mono-logoed data center, they just don't exist. People pick and choose what they like. The next shift I see is for our distributors. Our friends here at Cynix, and what I'm going to share with you is my aspirations for Cynix. The white writing is on the wall. You're heading this way anyway. The first thing you're going to do is move from product education to systems education. We're going to be teaching you business models. How do you implement healthcare systems? How do you implement transportation systems? How do you implement education systems? And here are the vendors that play well together in that space. And here are the business rules that you get to implement. And here's a set of business rules that are already pre-deployed in IT that you can sell to your customers. We're going to move from systems architecture to systems orchestration. And the reason why is because we are combining multiple vendors, both on-site, as well as in the cloud, as well as X as a service, as well as mobile devices, and stuff we have yet to invent. <laughs> We're orchestrating these, not architecting, orchestrating. And then we're moving from a vendor line card to vendor ranking. The question is, what vendors play well together? And I predict that we're going to move to a golden quadrant. That is the vendors that are willing to play by the golden rule, which is I'll treat your data like it's mine, and you're going to treat my data like it's yours. Who plays well together? I also see us going from product financing to business systems financing. One of the things that Cynix can do better than almost anybody else is finance technology. It's stuff that banks won't touch. So I see a great hit future for all of us playing together because Cynix can orchestrate the vendor relationships and the reseller relationships and the financing even though it's all in the cloud. This isn't going to change. We need this broker. We need the match.com of IT. Thank you, Cynix. Thank you, Varnix. And then for our partner business model, here's the transformation that you're going to go through. You're going to go from product acumen to business acumen. If you remember that wheel that I showed you, it's about the business model, the business rules, the team acumen, the customer systems that really create the value for an organization. 
you're going to get to know that a heck of a lot better. You're going to move from hardware deployment to systems orchestration. Change that word deployment to orchestration. You're going to be, somebody's got to plummet, somebody's got to secure the data, somebody's got to figure out disaster recovery and business continuity across multiple vendors in multiple locations. Your customers don't have the skills, they don't have the insights, you do. You're going to move from product sales compensation to customer success compensation. There are a few of you right now that are already taking a nick of your customer's revenues because you are their CIO. And the difference between you being their CIO and the CIO that you replaced is you say yes to every request. That's the difference. Does that make sense? Does that look good? Yeah, now you might be a little scared, but let me tell you, it should be more like roller coaster scared than gun to the head scared. And then the customer business model transformation, as you see, is going to follow the same thing. Your customers are going to a subscription model too. They're listed on Wall Street, they're going to be subscription. They're going from buying low cost and efficiency, the old days of buying five years worth of IT at a time, to buying speed and flexibility. You know what? They're willing to pay a little more for that. Flexibility is what allows them to rapidly adapt and adopt in the business world. They're going to be going from on staff data curators, you're going to be doing that, to business rules curators. And if the CIO does their job right, that's what they're going to oversee, is business rules curation. They're going to be going from IT acumen to data acumen, because that's the real value of the organization. They're going to be going from on-site IT to IT everywhere. So here is the pivot you must make if you're going to do this. You have to sell to the entire data value hierarchy. See, the bottom of the hierarchy are the data curators. These are the people that look after the servers, the storage, the networking. Do they care about the data? No. They couldn't care if it was the cure for cancer or candid pictures of cats. You couldn't care less. Next up, the data value hierarchy is the data creators. We used to call these people users. Stop that. You're really underselling who they are. The data creators are the folks that generate data for a living, and if they can't generate data for a living, they don't get a paycheck. These are the people in the accounting department, in the sales department, in the marketing department, the manufacturing department, in the world of entertainment. These are the artists that create movies and record music and write video games. And the reason why all shadow IT exists is because the data creators have gone to the data curators and asked for something, and the curators said no. So they pull out their corporate Amex and they buy services so they can get their job done. Do the data creators care about how their data is curated? No, they couldn't care less. At the top of the data value hierarchy are the data consumers. These are the people that must have data to run the company. They're the CEO, the CFO. They are the general of the army. They are the, the, the superintendent of the, of the school system. They're the mayor of the, the town. They're the, the governor of the, of, of, the, of the state. And without this data, they cannot do their job. Do they care about how their data is curated? They couldn't care less. Now, if data is valued X for the data curators, the data creators value is 10X and the data consumers are 100X. I want you to be selling to that enti entire data value hierarchy because all the money is at the top. So what these folks need to see is they need to manage the data, they need to mine the data, they need to monetize the data. They need visibility across all of the organization. They need insight and they need foresight to get their job done. And my friends, when you do that, you're going to make all kinds of money. So here's how you're going to bring new business value to your customers. You become an expert on the customer outcomes. You're going to know more about their business than anybody else. You become an expert on matching your resources to customer needs. You're going to do that through Cynix and Varnex. You're going to ask a lot smarter questions, and I'm going to teach you those questions. Not today. Later today, maybe. And you're going to sell an IT business case assessment. And when you come to my session at 3.55 today, I'm going to show you how to do that, why to do it, how to sell it, how to price it. Because in my opinion, that's the only way we can stay in this business. So in conclusion, my friend, your most valuable business assets are your business acumen and your customer trust. Because with that, you can sell them everything. So I invite you to come to my session. I'd also like to offer you a copy of my new book. Will you receive it as a gift? Are you sure? 
<laughs> Thank you, all of you. Here's how you get it. MSP2BSP.com, MSPTOBSP.com. You can register, you can download it immediately. My only request is if you like it, share it with as many people as you see fit. The copyright notice gives you permission to freely share the book. I want you to know this stuff, my friends. It's really important. And with that, I'm such a, it's such a delight to be a part of you. Thank you for all you do. Let's make a difference in the world. Did you catch that when he said free, the lights started flashing? <laughs>